first of all uh, hello priyanka and thank you so much for you know coming on csr lives expert talk and uh, you know being the you know country director of bbc media action i would just ask you for our audiences to give a brief introduction about you and the organization and you know then we can kick off the interview Sure. Thanks so much, Varun, and thank you to CSR Live for inviting us to speak today. Um, as you said, my name is Priyanka Dutt, and I'm the country director for BBC Media Action in India. BBC Media Action is part of the global BBC. We're the international independent charity arm or the NGO arm of the BBC. So what that means is that we use media and communication uh, for social impact causes around the world. We're part of the BBC, so we follow the BBC's ethos of public service broadcasting and public service media and communication, but we don't do news and current affairs. So instead, we use every other form of media and communication you can think of. So advertising work, television programs, radio programs, a lot of work on digital, a lot of work on on-ground outreach, really to sort of help people to well to inform people to connect them to each other and to inspire change where there is change required we work in three specific sectors so we work in public health we work in what we describe as governance and rights and we work in resilience which is both sort of economic resilience as well as climate change resilience um, we're about 20 years old globally and the india office is one of the oldest media action offices as well so we're um, if you like, we're one of the we're one of the stalwarts within what is otherwise quite a young organization. Absolutely, yeah, that that's great. So today we are here to you know uh, like of course we'll talk about the whole organization and the working of it. But right now we are here to talk about one specific project that actually interests me a lot right now that you guys have been going on in Bangalore, if I'm not wrong. So the a campaign that you guys have organized is called Invaluables. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you just like give a, a little brief introduction about the campaign as well? Sure. So the Invaluables is a campaign, yes, but it's part of a larger project, which in turn is part of a much larger initiative. So let me start at the larger initiative perspective and then work, work my way down to the Invaluables project or the campaign. So the initiative in Bangalore is funded by the H&M Foundation and it's called Samuhika Shakti. And essentially it's a collective impact uh, initiative, which means that multiple organizations have come together to work on a lots of different interventions, primarily to achieve a single goal. And that single goal, the vision of Samuika Shakti, is to enable the community of informal waste pickers in Bangalore to have greater agency to lead secure and dignified lives. So fundamentally, our work is focused entirely on the community of informal waste pickers in Bangalore. So there are lots of different partners who are working together. There's Save the Children, there's Care, there's Water Aid India, there's Social Alpha, the Nudge Foundation, LabourNet, um, and Hasirodala, who have been working in Bangalore for many, many years already with the waste picker communities. So what does BBC Media Action then do in this whole collective? Our job is really about changing perceptions of waste pickers and waste picking in general uh, in order to improve how waste pickers see themselves, but also in order to sort of raise generally the profile of waste management and the people behind waste management in Bangalore. So our project is called Pride. Uh, it's a pathway, <laughs> well, let me, let me make sure I get this correct. <laughs> it's a pathway to respect, identity, dignity, and empowerment. So it's an acronym. Um, we've slightly appropriated uh, things from a different space, but it's something that really we think speaks to the heart of what it is that we're trying to do. And essentially the Pride project is going to use a social media campaign plus outreach and activation to engage the general populations of Bangalore, so the, 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 you know, the people of Bangalore who are otherwise connected with the city through basically to sort of introduce them to who informal waste pickers are, and change the way, hopefully, take them on a journey that really changes the way that they see waste pickers. So the, the Invaluables campaign is the big offering of the Pride project. Uh, and it's, as you said, has just launched in, um, in Bangalore. And its inception comes not just sort of from thin air, so it comes from the way BBC Media Action approaches any project like this which is that there's a, there is a science to 
the way we do these things. And inevitably, it really starts with an understanding of the communities that we serve, because they are really at the heart of everything that we do. So I think that the best place to kind of start that conversation is to tell you a little bit more about the informal waste pickers and who they are, and yeah, yeah. really to, to sort of draw a distinction between formal and informal waste pickers. Because normally when you hear waste pickers, people think about the person who comes to your home to collect garbage, right? Or you think about waste segregation, you think about things like that, that are part of our normal everyday lives. And yes, those are waste because that they are part of the formal sector. So they are usually parts of collectives or associations or they're employees of municipal bodies. And usually a lot of them will have uniforms or a work identity. They will have access to benefits like social security schemes, et cetera. We are working with not with them, but with a different group of people. The informal waste pickers are not part of any structures or systems or organizations. Instead, there are three different categories of informal waste pickers that you will recognize as soon as I tell you about them. Because the first is street waste collectors. So people who literally will collect waste from the street or from garbage dumps and put them through the recycling process. The second is described as itinerant buyers. So these are the people who will come to your home and buy recyclable waste. So you know, newspapers, bottles, that kind of thing that you know, people will take away to put through the recycling process. And then there are sorters who work both within a formal setup and an informal setup. And they're the ones who, once the, once the waste is all collected, they're the ones who actually sort it into different categories and send it off into the recycling chain. So there's, you know, there's lots of different people in that group of informal waste pickers but they're fundamentally the, the big thing that we found in our process which starts with formative research which is a real understanding of what's happening in the community is that they're pretty much invisible people see waste you see waste on the street you care about waste on the street but people just don't think at all about the people who are involved in waste management so you might when you're sort of posed with a question, you might think about somebody who's collecting waste from the street, but on a normal day-to-day -day basis, they're completely invisible. And that invisibility is demonstrated in lots of different ways. So we saw, for example, that the formal waste pickers in Bangalore, Bangalore's Ora Karmikas, there's a great deal of appreciation for them because people recognize what they do. They, you know, they recognize that they play a role in waste management, but there's huge stigma against informal waste pickers who do very similar things, but in a different context and not in an organized manner, right? So what does that stigma look like? We found that, for example, people were, you know, very sort of, they had strong negative perceptions about informal waste pickers because of their physical appearance. So nearly 55% of our respondents said that informal waste pickers are dirty in appearance. Almost 56% of them said that they shouldn't be allowed into our colonies and complexes and societies because they bring disease. We found that women waste pickers were particularly vulnerable, facing abuse not just on the street, but also at home. So there's a, there's an, a, there's a sort of a compounded uh, vulnerability among the women. So where, where we started really with this understanding and with this formative research was to figure out how we could lift this shroud of invisibility. How could we do things that made that repositioned informal waste pickers from being invisible, from being seen as dirty, to really being seen as people doing important, skilled work that is critical to the survival of our cities and therefore to the survival of everybody's life, to you know, to a quality of life. Let me just pause there and see if you have any other questions because otherwise I can carry on about mm, the invaluable. That, that's no, of course. I mean whatever you were saying made absolute sense and because i feel like uh, waste management in our country has been a very big issue since the since a long time now that we have been focusing on it and we do tend to ignore a lot of aspects of it because for us uh organize so people who especially live in metropolitans like bangalore or like mumbai if if you live in a society there are there are people of the society who come and takes the waste out of like from your door uh, and you you actually don't know what is happening to the waste who is taking the waste because everything is covered in that maintenance thing that you pay so people are not really aware about what is happening who is doing it for you especially in covid times 
when uh, waste can be uh, actually pretty contaminated and can actually you know transmit a lot of disease such people are risking their lives to come and clean your house your waste for you so that is that is actually a excellent point that you have you know brought out right now but uh, my question here is that you know when you go for a project where you can actually uh, see the results right so if you are going for a project where you for example you are you are uh, making houses for people who cannot afford you know houses so you can see you know what i made hundreds of houses and these 100 families are now living in them but when you go for a project where you want to change the mentality of people where you want to uh, provide somebody with a dignity or you want you want the, because this is not something materialistic that you can measure right so how do you exactly see the results how do you see that there is a change coming in our society what what is the measure of it? so the measure of it is is sort of further down the line so let me tell you how we actually think about getting to that point first because that's really important right it's it's not just about um it's not enough to tell people that you should care about waste because because why would you know that doesn't really mean anything so we've got to find something and that's really where the 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 art and the craft of uh communication of social and behavior change communication comes to the fore which is that you've got to really find something that is going to appeal to not just people's rational minds but also to their emotional beings right to their emotional selves and that's where we then come up with big ideas that have the power to really be emotional to last over time to be media agnostic to be used in lots of different ways and the invaluables is an idea like that so the invaluables initiative really sort of seeks to reposition informal waste pickers as the friend you didn't know you had so that's what it is it's about sort of positioning them as people who are absolutely invaluable to you but they're invisible to you so how do we travel that journey from invisibility to being invaluable or to being recognized as invaluable and the way we've done that to start with and this is going to be you know a, a prolonged project so it's not sort of one and done in that sense so there there will be more uh, to come on this but the way we've started this project really is with a social experiment and what we did with this social experiment i'm sure you've seen the film is that we invited a group of bangaloreans to come in and talk to us about friendship and to talk about talk about who they think of as their friends and then presented to them the friends that they didn't know they had which is the waste picker community and it's that film the invaluables film that really launched uh, what we've created on facebook which is an invaluables group a community it's a moderated private group of people from bangalore people need to sign up to be a part of this group uh, and people need to sort of go through or answer a certain number of questions before they can actually join the community because we want people in this community who are engaged who are interested who really want to sort of participate in this conversation and it is through that conversation over time that we actually think that we will start to see changes in the way people think about waste pickers the way people talk about waste pickers and it's it's encouraging to see early results because we know that the film has been seen has has earned more than 15 million impressions in the first 6 weeks uh it's been watched more than 2 million times and it's reached at least 1.3 million people in bangalore which is about 10% of the population of bangalore so that's an exciting and sort of encouraging start but you know the change that we're seeking as you said as well is is it's hard to concretize right because it's complex it's so nuanced it's deeply deeply normative gen, you know formed over generations of thinking and of how society works and it's dependent on so many external you know variables so i think it's really important for us to think about change as a journey as a pathway so you might want eventually to get to the point where waste pickers are seen as equal what is it going to take to get there and there's no way that a 3 year project is going to change generations and millennia of of the way society works right so what is it that we can hope to achieve in 3 years what is it that we can hope to really drive and that's where we focused our um, you know our attention and that's where we focused our journey so what we're hoping to see in these 3 years is that we're hoping to see more conversation to start with about waste pickers about informal waste pickers 
removing that shroud of invisibility and really bringing them into conversations, both on social media and in drawing rooms, right? They don't exist there. So how can we actually bring them into those conversations? And it's through discussion, it's through conversation that we know that it's, you know, it's that that really changes the way you think about something. You think about anything else in your life. When do your, when do your opinions get shaped or when do your opinions get changed? It's when you're having discussions with people you care about and whose opinion matters to you. So it's that approach really that we're hoping to, to take to be able to get to that point where we can see greater discussion, uh, you know, more acceptance which is articulated by people themselves of waste pickers in their communities and in their societies. And equally, we want informal waste pickers to feel that there is a change in the way the city of Bangalore and the people of Bangalore are interacting with them. Because it's not enough just for the people of Bangalore to say that they have changed, but it's important for waste pickers to feel that change, right? Yeah, absolutely. So that is a excellent point. It just, uh, that, just you know makes me question one thing because uh, we keep on defining waste pickers as formal and informal right as mm-hmm. you correctly said so if you if you if you just told me that formal waste pickers have way more uh, i don't know response from people or or you know rec- acceptance let's say yeah, recognition or acceptance from people uh, when compared to the informal waste pickers right so my first question on this is that why don't we just remove that formal informal thing and why don't we just make those informal waste pickers into formal ones like you know make them part of an organization or make them make, give their work uh, you know I think a shape or like an organizational shape and secondly uh, what I want to ask is that you know uh, as you correctly said you want to start discussions regarding you know how informal waste pickers are not you know something to be overlooked and they are they should be considered as equal but right now here you are actually trying to change the mentality of people that has been formed i think and has been taught by uh, by our you know uh, parents or families or anybody that you know what if if you see somebody you you might not hate that person you might uh, value that person but you will never go and start or initiate a conversation or you know go and be like thank you so much for your services and i have like it is sad but it is what we have been taught in this country that you don't go and go and tell a waste picker that yeah thank you so much for doing this for us that is how we are brought up so how do you exactly try to bring a change in that so like that and i don't think like as you correctly said three years i don't think even 30 years can bring a change <laughs> to the reality of that you know and especially uh i'm so sorry the question is getting a little long but i'll repeat it for you if you want but it's just uh even when it comes to waste picker do you think they really care about you know as you said they should also feel that they are getting accepted do you think they they are so involved in this process of you know uh, thinking that you know how this person is looking at me because this is this is what i want to actually know because this is intriguing so i i hope you'll uh, you know being in the space for so long you'll be able to clear some of my doubts here so yeah. absolutely i think those are great questions varun so thank you for asking them and bringing them up so your first question was about why don't we just you know take informal waste pickers and make them formal waste pickers and job done. On paper, yes. But in reality, there are a hundred different barriers to doing that. Let's just break them down. So on the side of the system, which is where they would, you know, in order to formalize them, that's where they would need to join. There are limited resources available, right? So the BBMP, the, the, the municipal organization in Bangalore, only has a limited number of resources and therefore only has a limited number of positions. When you think about the fact that Bangalore at last count, and this this data is slightly outdated, there's been challenges with doing fresh research because of COVID, but at last count, there were were over 22,000 informal waste pickers in the city. That's a lot of jobs to create, right? And there are many barriers in trying to create all of those jobs. The second part of it, that's one that's sort of the on the policy or the system side of it. On the other hand, is the actual lives of waste pickers and what they want. So what they want isn't necessarily a job. It isn't necessarily wanting to put on a uniform and be a part of a system. Because there are also some of them who feel that there's a lot more 
um, flexibility in their lives. There's a lot more independence in their lives if they work for themselves. So if you're working as an informal waste picker, you're fundamentally a micro entrepreneur because that's what you're doing. You're, sorry, sorry. No, no. <laughs> you're, you're fundamentally, you're a micro entrepreneur. And what you're doing is that you're, you know, earning your own living on your terms, working for your, at, you know, the hours that are suitable to you on days that are suitable to you. It comes with a lot of uncertainty and it comes with a lot of vulnerability, but there is also a certain amount of choice that's exercised. The third thing that we cannot ignore is just our societal structures and the caste system and the acceptance of informal waste pickers who inevitably will belong to lower castes into formal structures. And the barriers that they face there can be pretty, pretty overwhelming. So it's not as simple as saying, let's just give everybody a job. However, you know, one of our partners, Hasrudala, they're doing have been doing for the last 10 years an incredible job in Bangalore because what they're doing is really bringing together informal waste pickers in the city to form collectives. So these are not organizations, but these are people coming together with a shared interest to be able to collectively bargain for their own rights. And it's through that collectivization and through that process that they've been able to negotiate for things like identity cards. It's things like applying for housing loans. It's things like applying for government benefits that are entitlements for them. So it's that power of collective action that Hasridal has really been able to enable uh, in the work that they've done. So there's, there's, it's, not a, it's not a straightforward answer. It's quite a complex issue. Um, but you know, it's where it's feasible. There have been several informal waste pickers who have become part of the formal system, but it's not ever likely to be everybody right uh your second question was about essentially generations of yeah i mean how we've been brought up right and the mentality of of society and it's your you know you you could not have said it better because it really is fundamentally that it's the caste system it's the way we've been brought up to be class because i mean we're a very classist society in addition to being a casteist society so anybody who is seen as other automatically there's a huge gulf right there's a huge chasm that we've got to be able to cross and that really is where the role of communication is so important and the role of media is so important because that's the thing that media does. It models behavior. It demonstrates how things can be or should be. It actually helps provide alternatives to the way you think, to the way you envisage the world. It helps you learn how, how to do things differently. So it's really, really important to, to do this work through media and communications, in addition to everything else, to be able to start to shape how the world is seen by people uh, in order to actually be able to address that change. Is that going to happen in my lifetime? Highly unlikely. I can only hope it'll happen in your lifetime. <laughs> but you know, it, yes, it is a stretch. But unless we actually do that work, unless we actually work at it every single day, it's not going to happen, right? So Yes, it does feel there are days when I think we all sort of wake up and go, this is futile. Why are we even trying this? Because it's just nothing's ever going to change. But nothing's ever going to change unless we actually try and make that change. Right. So we've got to do whatever we can. And that I think also you, you sort of talked about do waste pickers care. And I think there's something in there about, you know, as well, a balance between uh, accepting where people are now or people accepting where they are now and sort of the, the sense of this is what my fate is and this is what life has in store for me. At the same time, really, I mean, aspiration is a human trait, right? Just because you have less doesn't mean you want less. In fact, it's often, you know, it, it, it can be quite, uh, it, it just, I think it's really important for us to think about waste pickers as human beings just like you and me. They're people who have the same dreams and aspirations for themselves, for their children, for their families. They want to be treated with respect and with dignity. They want to have something that, you know, is, is a future with, that, that they can look forward to. It's, 
making that a reality is much more difficult for them because of the huge number of socioeconomic challenges in their way. So do they care? Yes, absolutely, deeply they care. They definitely want to be treated you know, like people, like human beings. And we heard this over and over again in our research is that, you know, we just, if that could change, if somebody could talk to me like a human being, things would be different, right? And that, that's what really gives you the sense of how people, are, how, how waste makers are treated. They're not treated like people. They are treated like dirt. And that's where the stigma comes in. Now, how do you get people to change that? What we're doing is that we're focusing on, and again, our research is telling us this, our, we're focusing on groups of people that we've been able to identify whom we're describing as appreciators and sympathizers. So these are people who um, recognize the challenges that waste pickers face. They believe already that there is a great deal of inequity in the way waste pickers are treated. And they believe also that they have a role to play in changing that. So they might have a lot of, so the sympathizers obviously have a lot of sympathy for waste pickers, but need to travel a journey as well to sort of think about waste pickers as being people who can be empowered. Appreciators are the ones who are already at the far end of the scale where they're thinking of, uh, of waste pickers as, or they, there's already a great deal of appreciation there. The group that we're not starting to work with, that we're not targeting, are the stigmatizers, because we know they are going to be the hardest to shift. So it's better to start with what's effectively low-hanging fruit, the people who are more likely to change, who are already on that pathway, and then use that to build sort of momentum, to build more conversation, to build more thinking, to build more, you know, greater attitudes in the city that change the way that Bangalore interacts with its informal waste pickers. Actually, uh, like before anything, I, I was actually looking uh, for that answer for our audiences that you know how you said that you know sometimes it might feel uh, feel like it's futile to actually go and try to change generations of thinking because it, the problem is that in a in a diverse country like India that is our strength of being diverse and having so much of diversity in people languages or uh, culture everything but with it comes the some fixed, uh, I don't know, notions or stigma that we have been like carrying out for generations and not like just two, three generations, like since I don't know since when. Uh, so it sometimes might feel like, you know what, like let's just go and focus more on something like, uh, let's just give the waste pickers something that they can use rather than going and trying to make them a part of the society or changing the mentality. But somebody needs to start, right? And you guys are doing that. So that's, that's brilliant because as you correctly said, we won't make a change until unless we start trying to make a change. So we need to start. That's that's great. Secondly, uh, what you said about you know, uh, if if waste, I asked you if waste pickers care, and you said they absolutely do. So and I believe, of course, of course they do. Uh, I just want to know one thing because it's it's like intriguing uh, me a little that. Uh, if, if, for example, these informal waste pickers, right, and correct me if I'm uh, wrong, uh, they are not registered anywhere, right? They uh, do they are they officially uh, like uh, do ha do they have some uh, registration somewhere, or they are just people who you know do this without actually uh, being part of a formal system? So they are not registered, right? They are they are just unknown people who do this. So it's a combination. There are some who have been waste pickers for generations and therefore they are part of informal collectives. So they're not part of, say, a government system. Okay. They may not be on a registry of informal waste. There, there isn't any such thing as, an, as a registry of informal waste pickers. Exactly. Yeah. But, so, okay, but no. also you have to, sorry, just to, just to add context there. So there's two things. First is that organizations like Hasrudala and several others who work with waste pickers already have sort of a, it's not a registry, but they have a, a sort of a database of who's there. The other factor to remember is that waste pickers tend to be, um, they tend to move quite a bit. They tend to be more migratory than other communities. So there's a lot of changeability in that waste picker community. Okay. Uh, so my question was uh, that I wanted to know is that these informal waste pickers who have been doing that, and as you correctly said, they are, anybody wants more, right? Nobody 
like i don't think even the world's richest guy is satisfied at any point of his life he also wants more so everybody has that desire to keep growing right so if uh, do do you do your organization or any organ, organization as such also work on you know providing them skills that they can you know use in some other occupation because if they are informal ways because and they're just doing it i I'm, i'm not sure that's why i'm asking you i don't want to be wrong here that i don't think they would be very passionate about way speaking or something like that or th- they would be ki, uh, you know what i i, I want to get up in the morning and this is what i want to do i think they like majority of them must be doing it because they couldn't actually do something else and they didn't get the opportunity to do something else so if providing them with an opportunity of getting skilled in some other occupation which provides them a more stable uh, you know job or work environment or a more stable livelihood wouldn't that be a better way to you know proceed or go i'm just like uh, asking because i i just want to know you're absolutely right i mean i don't know whether it's better or worse i think it's all equally needed and that's exactly why i think the samuhika shakti design is um you know gives us the best chance of success because what you've just described which is skill skill building and livelihood training is what our partners labor net and care are doing um our partners save the children are working with the children of waste pickers and ensuring that they stay in school and get an education um our organizations like your know, partners like social alpha are working on innovative re, sort of um what's the uh, how do i describe it they, they're working on innovations that really look at new ways of making waste streams more uh financially viable so they're looking at different business models like that uh water aid is looking at sort of wash and you know the water sanitation hygiene uh factors hasrat ala is doing a lot of work on social security with waste pickers as well as with gender based violence substance abuse so it's a it's truly a collective approach that looks at addressing lots of the different barriers that come together to create uh you know a certain set of circumstances for informal waste pickers and the the ingoing assumption for the samuhika shakti team and the team is is a large number of organizations who are working together for us the assumption is that we need to all be doing things simultaneously and working in this collaborative manner collectively uh with a with sort of a great deal of depth so it's we're working with what is relatively a small community of people because at most it's about 20000 people i want to ask you uh, this that why exactly did the bbc media action team or like other choose waste pickers i mean was there a specific reason did you, did you guys see something happen drastically that you guys had to go for it or this is one of the few projects that you guys are going to take up in the future as well so you it's just part of it so yeah Yeah. So it's 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 a um it, it, this is it's not a black and white answer. So BBC Media Actions work over the years. I mean I talked about the fact that we work in governance and rights and we work in resilience and resilience for us also means economic opportunity. And we've done work since 2011 I think it was uh when we start, first started working on what we describe as decent work. Um and initially it was around the prevention of bonded labor so we worked you know with on projects funded by the us state department and then by the google foundation on really looking at or working with tribal communities in north india uh to prevent bonded labor to really help them find way well a knowing what their rights were but also finding ways of protecting themselves that work that concentration or that focus on decent work is something that we've brought into the samuhika shakti work as well because it's that commitment to making sure that people have uh, the right to a decent livelihood right the other part of it is that for the last 6 years we've worked in sanitation in india um, so whether it's you know working on india's open defecation free status whether it's working on fecal sludge management we've done a lot of work on that part of the sanitation chain and this was a really interesting sort of way of expanding the work that we're doing on sanitation into solid waste management as well but it then brings together the the sanitation work the work on the 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 projects that we've done on decent work and our focus very much on people and people who are at the heart of 
um, just, just sort of improving their lives, that kind of comes together. It's also a segue for us strategically, we think, into the work that we are very, very keen on doing as we go forward on building a portfolio on, which is on climate change. Because anything that you're doing with solid waste management today, there are overlaps immediately with sustainability. And that's something, you know, that's an area that we're deeply interested in as well. So it fits very nicely, very strategically with the way BBC Media Action thinks about its work in India. Um, the opportunity came to us from H&M Foundation. So it's not like we went out to H&M Foundation. They, they were the ones who came up with the idea of working with waste pickers in Bangalore. And in the conversations with them, we found that there's a really great meeting of minds, meeting of strategy, meeting of interest areas. And that's where, uh, you know, the, what we proposed then to the H&M Foundation is what they wanted us to, uh, they, what they wanted to invest in and what we ended up working on. So what I was saying is that uh, this is one of the important topics that you guys have chosen and the work you guys have been doing is brilliant, uh, especially all the organizations together because you guys are attacking the problem from all fronts. What I understood is that you're, you're actually seeing it through from all the aspects, not just, you know, going and trying to make them and get them a recognition, but also trying to build their skills and making them uh, better economically or financially or every in each and every way so that's that's brilliant uh, <clears throat> before i wrap up this conversation i just have this one last question till now after starting this campaign i did whatever time it has been what changes do you see till now? like are, are, they, are there are there some changes that you see or is it still too early to see the changes that you expected so what is it so uh there's two things first is that we it is too early to start to see significant change. It's been, I think, uh, six weeks, maybe eight weeks since we launched. It's way too early. But we will actually know more about what kind of change we've achieved and how far we've gone down this road because we are doing research. So for us, it's really, really important to do that research to check the effectiveness of what we've done. Um, so we are doing an impact assessment of all of this work where we're doing, we're evaluating everything. So it, it's an evaluation of whether or not we've achieved what we set out to achieve with the communication we, we've uh, implemented. So the, um, I think the first phase comes to an end at the end of June. Uh, so sometime in July is when we will do our first assessment. First phase, first round of assessment. We'll do this multiple times through the course of the project so that we get data continuously both to feed back into what we're doing and help improve the next stage but also to keep learning whether or not we're actually getting where we said we wanted to get to um so watch this space i think is the answer to that question <laughs> that we're hoping we're hoping we've got somewhere we will be we will be looking at it very closely and i hope we uh, get you here again after the span of time of the project or sometime in the middle and we again discussed this because it was it was actually very very uh, i don't know what's the correct word inspiring for the whole team of csl live and for our audiences to have you here and you know talk about this important major issue that we are facing and it's it's it it actually you know makes me so happy to see that organizations such as yours are focusing on such trivial issues that if you do not focus on it people might not even know about it you know they might not even uh, think about it for a second because uh, that is how we are basically. So uh, thank you so much for doing this and thank you so much for being here with us and uh, having this uh, wonderful conversation uh, and I hope that we get you here again very soon. Is there something you want to tell us and the audiences before we wrap up the conversation? Is there some message you want to give? So please go ahead. Join the Invaluables Facebook group because that's where you learn a lot more about the waste because you'll hear from them, yourself, hear from them directly yourself on that group. But uh, thank you very much for having us here, for having me here, Varun. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure and it's, it's really useful. You know, it's, it's, it's inspiring for us as well um, when we're doing this work to have people interested in the work and to have people interested in what we're doing and why we're doing it. So thank you for, um, you know, for CSR Live's interest as well. And I, I'd be very happy to come back and tell you more when we know more about the work. Absolutely. absolutely. And we'll be keeping a close watch. We'll be following it on, on the social media. And I urge all of our audiences as well to go and, you know, uh, join the social media groups of Invaluables or any social media platform and be updated with it. Uh, and thank you so much again for being here. And I hope uh, we get to talk soon, very soon again. Thank you. Thank you, Prem. Wonderful. Thanks so much.